America's foreign policy is yet again hamstrung by domestic politics. Hello and welcome to the next edition of the After Action Report on the Trump-Russia cyber peace deal. My name is Brandon Weikert, founder and CEO of the Weikert Report, and discuss the possibility of creating a, quote, impenetrable cybersecurity unit. And this would basically address issues like the risk of cyber meddling in elections and, and who knows what else. But here's a breakdown of what's going on in the cyber warfare world. Russia is, as Bloomberg is reporting, that Russia is, is suspected of hacking a dozen U.S. power plants, including a nuclear power plant. And as the report goes on to say, very prospect because there are no rules of engagement that protect civilians, the asymmetrical warfare that cyber and terrorism uh, represent. Remember, back in, 19, in 2003, when the East Coast blackout occurred, uh, the power was restored within hours, but the event led to mass protests and rioting and awful traffic, food, water supplies disrupted, urban life was plunged into chaos. It was like, uh, uh, you know, the, the walking dead uh, out there. Um, the ability for Russia to do crippling attacks on American infrastructure is apparently a response and on some level to... Um, exactly what the Obama administration, according to the Washington Post last month, uh, did in terms of quote-unquote implanting um, hidden offensive malware within critical Russian infrastructure after it was discovered that Russia was indeed uh, launching cyber attacks upon the DNC servers in the 2016 election and attempting to sow general discord and distrust within the uh, contentious American presidential elections last year. Uh, this is their form of retaliation, apparently. Indeed, we've seen this happening in Ukraine, where the Ukrainian power grid, a country that is under threat of Russian invasion every day, or further invasion, rather, um, is it has been attacked and probed by what is believed to be Russian Hacker. So attacks on civilian services, while in any other form of warfare outside of cyber and probably space, uh, any other form of warfare would be uh, a, a banned kind of attack. It was illegal. And there would be serious international ramifications for the country that did this. Now, of course, as we've seen, Russia's going to break all the rules at once because it's Russia. But still, having those rules in place does lend um, America a degree of credibility when seeking to defend itself from Russian aggression. So keep that in mind. Um, there's no cyber war equivalent to the Hague or Geneva Conventions, uh, which means that civilians, much like they found on 9-11, civilians will be the number one target. And that is not any way to, to go about life, especially today when we're so interconnected and dependent on cyber technology. So when President Putin floats a concept of maybe let's creating a... Uh, a joint cyber unit, sure, yeah, it's kind of like the fox asking the fox to guard the hen house, but the, the Russians are just as afraid, if not more so, as I've written on the Weikert report, uh, about the fact that without some kind of rules governing the use of warfare in, in the cyberspace domain, that in fact actually the United States, since we were the ones who created the internet basically, and we all of the dominant, most of the dominant tech companies and technological experts are either in America or trained in America, uh, we actually are a bigger threat in that realm than we give ourselves credit for. And the Russians know this. And so this concept of maybe floating a peace deal, a cyber peace deal, is actually not a bad one. Now, it may be not going anywhere, and it may just be Putin grave dancing, but it's not a bad idea. Um, now, the usual suspects in Washington, D.C. Uh, have been opposed to this concept uh, as soon as it was announced yesterday. Um, everyone from Republicans on the Hill, such as Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina and John McCain of Arizona, to Democrats such as Congressman Adam Schiff out of California, as well as former Obama administration officials such as um, former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter. And the basic argument is that, well, we, that's like the, the having the fox guard the hen house. And to be sure, the, you know, the details of such an agreement are not well known. And as you know from listening to me, I am a Russia skeptic, but I'm 
also someone who favors engagement with Russia because I don't really know what the alternatives are. Again, we are not going to go to war, nor should we, nor should we want to, unless American interests are threatened directly. And we are not going to simply ignore them anymore because when you ignore Russia, they end up being a bigger problem for us. You know, we're looking for a third way. It was an idea that was floated, my understanding is, by Putin himself. They didn't spend much time talking about it. Basically, Trump said he'd taken under advisement. I understand the critics. Uh, I, I, I get what they're saying and their concerns uh, in Washington and throughout the West. And so everybody else is talking about that. I would like to briefly just address the issue of whether it's a good idea or not. Let's keep in mind that the United States actually has a pretty strong history of um, very specific, tightly coordinated, tightly regulated issues uh, having success in foreign policy engagement and coordination with Russia. Uh, in the 1990s, after the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union collapsed, the American special forces and intelligence community, thanks to Russian elements, were able to basically ensure that no former Soviet nukes were loosed and, and given over or sold to rogue states like Iran or North Korea, or that they were sold to terror groups like Al-Qaeda, which we know Al-Qaeda in the 90s was looking for this. That's a huge win. Uh, that was be only because of close coordination between American and Russian authorities. Second of all, after 9-11, American and, and Russian counterterrorism cooperation was very strong. In fact, the Russians, long before the attacks ever happened in 2013, the Russians had been s sending up warning flags to uh, American intelligence services, I think upwards of two years before these the, the horrible Tsarnaev brothers of Chechnya were in America and, and plot, plotted to attack uh, the Boston Marathon. And so uh, this notion that there is no basis for, in the recent history, for effective Russian-American cooperation is not true. It's disingenuous. Um, and in each case, it was a very specific issue that we coordinated the Russian, on the Russians with. It wasn't carte blanche. It wasn't an opening of the doors telling the Russians to here, come on in. In terms of influence operations, the concern is that, well, the Russians would learn the kind of the, the, the family jewels when it comes to all the family secrets in the American cyber world when it comes to how we conduct cyber attacks and espionage. My understanding, though, was Ed Snowden pretty much gave the Russians the NSA playbook when he requested asylum there. And second of all, my understanding was also that, according to the mainstream media today, that the Russians' cyber abilities are so great that they effectively, quote-unquote, stole the election away from Hillary Clinton, the presumptive you know, winner of 2016, and gave it, quote-unquote, to Donald Trump. Um, apparently, the Russians have the ability to fake the votes of 62 million Americans. So if those reports are true, maybe we could actually learn something from the Russians. I don't think it's the, the best idea, It's but I also think that we're in a situation today geopolitically, I've written about this at the Weikert Report, we're no longer in a unipolar world. We're in a quasi-tripolar, potentially multipolar, uh, America is still the first among equals, but that position is being eroded by rising states like Russia and China. Um, America is going to need to pull out its old playbook of geopolitics and start making deals and doing business with unsavory people. It's not the first time we've done that, and it's not the first time we've worked with the Russians. And in terms of espionage from the Russians, I would like you all to please pick up Whitaker Chambers' book, Witness, or Diana West's recent book, American Betrayal, to see just how deep Soviet and Russian influence operations throughout the Cold War were in America, and how little the current, you know, the Democrats and the, the, the intelligence community, or at least parts of the intelligence community and, and parts of the media really cared about it. Um, in fact, Brian Littell, former CIA man, wrote a great book, Castro's Secrets, the CIA in Cuba's intelligence machine. And th this book was backed up by the renowned scholar James Pearson, who wrote Camelot and the, Age the Cultural Revolution, How the Assassination of John F. Kennedy Shattered American Liberalism, and more recently, Shattered Consensus, 
the rise and decline of America's post-war political order, in which they basically make the very compelling case that Castro, in, at the very least, had foreknowledge and did nothing to warn us about the fact that JFK was going to, the assassination attempt by Lee Harvey Oswald was going to be made. Um, now, that's still a controversial thing, and we'll never know for sure until the, the classified documents are unclassified by the go U.S. government on the Kennedy assassination. But clearly, there are legitimate researchers and intelligence professionals looking at the data that's in open source forms uh, and uh, saying that there is something to the fact that we may have actually been attacked by, through presidential assassination by the communist bloc vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Castro supporting Oswald in, in some way. Now, that theoretical, but obviously there's something there. And yet we didn't. We didn't. We never responded to Castro. We didn't do anything against him. In fact, after Kennedy's death, America tamped down on all of the rhetoric of killing Castro and his and his top notch, his top echelon of people. Ultimately, Obama tried to do a deal with them in the last years of his in office. Similarly, on cybersecurity issues, the last point I'd like to make is that the same people who are decrying Trump for even listening to this idea are the same people who are at once complaining for the last seven years that there are no, quote, rules of engagement in cyber warfare because nobody's working with each other in terms of great power cooperation. And secondly, the same people who are lambasting this concept are the same people who are touting Obama's attempt to get a similar deal with the Chinese back in 2014, if memory serves, 2013 or 2014. And the point is that this is all domestic politics. And in fact, our country's foreign policy has become so infected with bitter partisan rancor that uh, we couldn't even have a reasonable conversation about the potential of accepting Vladimir Putin uh, and his listening, hearing him out and listening to what he had to say about the potentiality of creating this cyber peace deal. Uh, we'll we'll never know what come what would have come come of it, but uh, one thing is for certain: it's not going to happen now, given how the public, the the mainstream media and uh, foreign policy graybeards in Washington have reacted. It's very unfortunate. Maybe it shouldn't have happened, but it was worth looking into beyond just hand wringing in the press. Putin is looking to do a deal. And now he may have been grave dancing. You know, we know that he was engaged in cyber attacks on the DNC and trying to uh, troll the American election. Putin's goal with the American election was not about making Hillary lose or making Donald Trump win. Putin's goal was simply to get most of many Americans to cast doubt on the legitimacy of their democratic institutions. It was also meant as a public display of Russian power and that, hey, we're still relevant. Um, once American leaders recognize this and once Unfortunately, this is primarily the Democrats, but also some foreign policy graybeards in the Republican Party who can't help but see a Russian under every bed because of 50 years of the Cold War. I'm not saying that I agree, but I understand it. We have to really start taking a step back and recognizing Russia for what it is. Uh, there was a Russian dissident who uh, was featured on uh, Paul Goebel's blog a few months back um, in which he was basically sa saying that Russia is essentially... Um, it has gone from being a, a major world power over the last 70 years to being a mid-level power to now being a primitivized, as are his words, primitivized third world country that just happens to have nukes. And so when you recognize that Russia's threat is existential only to itself, unless we continue to push Russia into a corner whereby it's forced to either become a client state of the Chinese or it starts lashing out with nukes, uh, against the West, there are deals to be made. And I can think of nobody better to make this deal than Trump, uh, the man who wrote The Art of the Deal. And in terms of the cyber unit, if it's limited in scope and if it helps us create working rules of the road, I don't know why that's a bad thing. I don't like the Russian you know, military and the Russian offensives and the Russian foreign policy. I hate it, in fact. And I think that Putin is a, a very, very bad person. But America's done deals with devils before. Uh, and in the short term, it works, as long as we maintain that it's going to be a short-term, limited engagement. So while everybody else is complaining about how Trump has supposedly yet again, but he hasn't, sold, sold the store, I, I just wanted to give you another take. Maybe the cyber unit is a necessary first step. Um, maybe it's not the, the fox guard in the hen house. Maybe it's a real attempt to, to get a, a working rules of the road and to build up an alliance with a major power that can be used to stop the Chinese, who are without a doubt the most pernicious threat America faces in the cyber realm. For the Weikert Report, I'm Brandon Weikert. Thanks so much.
Why should I miss it? Yeah. Are you sure? Hey, the guy was not hard to follow, as you know. Why the fuck would they go to the Russians? Why the fuck? I, I'm sorry. Thank you.